Hi everyone, and a massive welcome to another exciting and insightful episode here on InfoSec Live. This time, what is a field chief technology officer with Jay and John Spiegel from Axis? Not Jay Spiegel, Jay Tilson and John Spiegel from Axis. My name is Simon Linstead. I'm the person incapable of speech today and the founder of the InfoSec Live community. And before we bring Jay and John on, by sharing stories and best practice over the last few months, it's led to nearly 50,000 views and 8,000 hours of our content being watched on YouTube by you, our amazing subscribers. So a huge thank you for your engagement and the support. And if you'd like to support the wider InfoSec Live community, or indeed buy me a cheeky decaf coffee in my Coffee with Jay mug, we do have a few ways that you can show your appreciation. First up, the ability to purchase super stickers in the YouTube chat if you'd like your question bumped up to the top, and three tiers of membership allowing you to show your support in any way that you can. But whether you join or not, being here and engaging with our content is what really matters. So if you're watching this live, please do like and subscribe. We want to make them interactive. Make sure you drop any questions you have in the chat. After all, it's you, our audience, who does make these events so special. Now, Jay and John often get asked about their role of field CTO and what it actually entails. And the role, as we all see, is on the rise across the tech industry with many companies at the leading edge hiring field CTOs. But what is a field CTO and what do they actually do? Let's bring Jay and John on and find out. I can't even get my words out today. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, we, gents. We all, know, we all know Jay will get his words out. I'm sure he will. I mean, I'm, actually, we haven't even mentioned pizza for a while, so I'll just get that in first before we start. But look, for those who haven't watched this before, I was saying to you guys earlier in the chat, I think your previous episodes where you've come on and spoke on the vendor experience have nearly had a combined thousand views. So I would have thought most people would know who you are, but do you both mind just doing a quick one or two minutes background on who you are and where you've been? I'll start with you, John. Yeah, so John Spiegel, um, currently, I guess you would say field CTO for Access Security. Um, roughly, and this is where my gray hair comes in, uh, 25 years of experience on the enterprise side. So ran large infrastructure teams for a global retailer here, uh, which encompassed all platform, storage, compute, cloud, networking, all the things that go into delivering an IT solution. Um, ran those and did that for a long period of time, but also had an opportunity to as well work with startups, work with some of the major security vendors out there, some of the major networking companies, and really enjoyed that experience uh, was helping them develop their product, giving feedback, uh, some of the go to market aspects of um, you know, what they were doing. Uh, they would come to me and say, hey, is this a good idea? Is this not a good idea? So really enjoyed that. And then also had the opportunity to speak at a lot of the major IT um, conferences, VMworld, uh, Interop, uh, those are just a few at Palo Alto Ignite and uh, just really enjoyed the job. And then um, COVID happened and I took a break for a period of time and then got back into the industry. And uh, we'll, we'll leave the rest of that story and turn it over to Jay. Thank you very much for sharing, John. Now, I know you won't have any problem filling two minutes, Jay. Without mentioning pineapple on pizza, it's your turn. Off you go. Um, so not too dissimilar background to John, really. So started off... Um, IT support, started off doing first line support, then second line support, third line support, then managed the team, um, got involved quite early on in kind of VMware virtualization. Um, again, like John, talked at VMworld and stuff like that, quite an early adopter of that tech. 
uh, manage global teams, work for large manufacturing companies um, based out of Japan initially. And then a UK manufacturer did some work with Mercedes Formula One, which really enjoyed it. It's a passion of mine. Um, kind of an early adopter, I guess, of what we now call zero trust. At the time, I didn't know it was zero trust, um, but went down the route of a ZTNA product. Um, kind of got the buzz, really. And during the pandemic, spent some time kind of thinking about what I was going to do next. And did I continue kind of up the IT and security kind of ladder or do I, I switch sides? And really, I wanted to work for a company and, and do something that was giving back. I'd spent quite a lot of time in, in IT and security and we have a really good community and a, a lot of really helpful people. And a lot of people were kind of mentored and coached me along my journey. I uh, really wanted to do that, wanted to help people out. Um, wanted to kind of enable companies to be secure and enable their workforces to work it work at home and work hybrid for those that can. Um, also got similar gray hair, 25 plus years in the industry, um, which is kind of what led us, I guess, both me and John to, to be in a field CTO. CTO. I was hoping, really, Simon, you can answer the question of what that meant, um, what kind well, of role we have, but I guess we'll have to make it up as we go along. I mean, I said this to you before. So my background's financial services. Um, a chief techno a field chief technology officer to me would be someone who helped a business identify mergers and acquisitions, look at tech stacks in businesses they're acquiring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that isn't what we're talking about. And I think, well, it might be, you could correct me, but I think the role we're talking about is a field CTO, field CISO, even strategic director type role that we see more and more of coming up. And the main reason I wanted you to come on and chat about this is because I haven't got a clue. All I know is that you're the only two guys who I've got kind of in my close network who do the role. And I know that you're super busy all the time. So apart from that, <laughs> let's, let's, throw it, let's throw it back to John and find out what you're busy doing. Yeah, so uh, this was interesting. So I, I kind of laid out my, my previous past and, and how this all came about. Um, and the reason I'm in the role is I had some conversations when I decided to go back to, to work after a little uh, COVID family support break and reached out to my circle of, of advisors, I guess you would say, for lack of a better word, and was talking to one of them that was an um, executive at, at VMware in the um, NSX uh, business unit. So that's their network security business unit. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go back. I'm itching to go back. And I said, here's this opportunity. And he's like, look, you, you need to stop that. You need to stop going back and kind of doing what you're doing. You've done that. Uh, but what you're really good at is taking these technical terms, putting them into business jargon and um, being that go between. And I said, OK, great. Uh, but I don't want to do sales. He says, it's not a sales role. It's really taking um what you've learned uh, with your experiences and, and, you know, working with the customer on the other side, educating them, being an advisor, uh, and the skill you really need to have is empathy for the customer. Because um, as we know, sales is very transactional. Um, yeah. The person wants to be your friend. There's a reason why they want to be your friend. Um, do they really know all the things that are going on in you know your life from a regular basis, your job, the, the stresses, the pressures, how it works to be in a, an organization, the budgeting process? They don't. They're after one thing is that delivering that PO. Um, and he said, you know, that's an area where you can really be effective is creating that uh, that relationship, that empathy, having some some information to offer them that maybe in their journey they haven't, uh, you know, uh, gone through yet. And uh, it really resonated with me. And, and when I went out and looking for, for roles, that's the type of role I, I was looking for. Jay, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, let, let me let me jump in quickly before Jay oh, okay. starts sure. talking for 10 minutes. Um, you mentioned the word <laughs> sales, which obviously is the only thing I've got any experience in. And lots of people judge sales as cold outreach, banging on the door, annoying people, sending you messages on your inbox. Now, that is only one small part of the sales process. And Absolutely. I think what I'd like to dig into with both of you, maybe pass this over to, to Jay, is where do you step in in that process? Because I'm, I'm taking that with all your experience and the fact that you're building empathy and understanding, that's something that salespeople with this much knowledge just can't do. You know, I've said it to people before, you know, what's the, when people have asked, what's the best way to build a relationship or get business from a CISO? And, and I always say the same, which is you've got to build the relationship first and listen to them and understand. 
but ha- and mm-hmm. understand where, where their pain points are and what their drivers are. But for someone with a sales hat on, that's a really difficult task to expect someone in a leadership position to share their pain points with someone who's never done the job before. Is that where you come in, Jay? Yeah, I mean, f- firstly, let me start with the whole title thing. So field CTO, also sometimes called tech advisor, um, technology advisor, evangelist, director of strategy. I think they're all similar roles. I mean, there are slight differences. But what we actually do is we we wear several hats. We listen to the customer and understand the customer. And that sounds maybe arrogant, but we've been customers for 25 years. Yeah. So we have been the people that have made the hard decisions. We've been the people that have been sold to for a long period of time. And is that where the gray hair came from? That's where the gray hair came from. So I can say that because I've got just for men on mine. Oh yeah, no, I definitely yeah. got gray hair. I, I, so I think I'm not saying we understand every scenarios, but we, we've certainly worn the trousers. We've, we've grown up in it. We've seen technology change and, We've been there and, and had to make those difficult decisions and also look at technology, understand the technology, but also do the cultural element of stuff, team management, budgeting, all of those things. So we understand the wider arena. So we understand that the stresses and the strains that people are under because we were under those stresses and strains themselves. And I I used to refer to the sales team that used to come in and try and sell to me. I used to refer to them. I used to refer to the salesperson as the liar and the technical person is the truth. And I've said this before, so I don't mind saying it again. I would quite often look at the SA or the solutions architect or the technical guy in the room or the technical girl in the room. And when the salesperson was telling me that they could do everything they were doing or, or could do, I would look at the salesperson, uh, sorry, the technical person. If they started to cringe, I'd be like, <laughs> this is not the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. Selling has changed a lot over the last 25 years. There are a lot more better salespeople out there. You tend to get a lot more of the truth and referring to them as the liar is a little bit unfair. Um, But we are one step beyond that. Those people are still, they're they're incentivized. Is that even a word? There's a, v in in it. It. There's a V in it, but yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 they're there to sell. They get commission-based and all of those kind of things. And really, they're there to close deals and close numbers. Now, we're, we, don't, we're, we don't get paid in that way. So there's a number of benefits we have that we can build longer-term relationships. We can be honest and we can say, the product isn't right, like, right there right now, but not only can we build that relationship, but we can take those customer f- information, that feedback, and we also spread it internally. So we have also have an internal role where we can talk to R&D, project management. We can explain why the customers have got issues or questions or want design features or that kind of stuff. And we can explain it in a way that we understand. This, this sounds like everything a, a startup business needs but can't afford, Jay. Well, I think a lot of tech businesses need it because I've I've certainly been asked quite a lot, and I know John's been asked quite a lot recently, what what is your role? So it's that kind of external facing trusted advisor role, and it's that internal being able to help the R and D, help PM, and also help the sales team. Help yeah. the sales team understand because the world we live in, unfortunately, salespeople quite often move around all the time right? It, it's just the world we live in that they don't spend the same kind of time in a, in a company. And actually, I used to deal with a large UK company that would quite often sell, change my account manager on a six monthly basis. So they don't get to build relationships. They don't need to, un, don't get to understand the products. Whereas we can build those relationships. We've built those relationships in the past already. We can build them going forward and we can rely on those relationships because if we can't do something right now in the product and we can't make it happen in the next three or six months, we can then reach back out to those people and say, you asked us for this six months ago, we can now do it. John, yeah, play, I don't know play if you want to advocate that. for those sales managers and sales teams out there. There's sometimes a really good reason why they get rotated every six months. You know, if, if there's no 
relationship if there's no kind of traction between you and the person you've got on your account sometimes bringing in a new face does help but i completely agree with the point Salespeople aren't given enough time to build those relationships by the nature of the role itself. It's very, very difficult to do. So I suppose that's where you guys step in. Um, John, do you want to pick up this question that's come in? It's a good one from Q Wade Billings. Thanks for tuning in. He's put, just beginning his journey as a field CTO, CIO. Do you have advice on the must do things and things to must not do in building trust and credibility with clients? It's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the first the must not to do is is don't overstate uh, the product. Uh, don't position the product in an incorrect way. Uh, know its limitations. Uh, sales and, you know, d- despite what Jay said there about SEs, they're going to push the product. They're incented to, to, to do it. Um, a field CTO really shouldn't be part of the sales organization in my mind. Uh, you must be a trusted advisor if that product works for you great. If there's another product that works a little bit better, you've got to be honest uh, because your role is long-term. It's not turn and burn. It's not, Hey, let's get this deal through. And then, uh, you know, someone else will come through and pick up the pieces. You're there for the long-term. So you have to be invested in that relationship. And that means being transparent and and always maintaining your dignity and, and never crossing that, that's that line that, sometimes salespeople do. So those are the, um, those are the things you can't do. Uh, the things you must be very good at is being able to take a technology and translating it into a business outcome. That is the most important thing you must be able to talk to. Because uh, if you can't talk to that, that's, it, it's going to be a difficult uphill battle for you to be successful in this career. You also must be able to work not only with the external uh, uh, people, but also the internal people. So Jay mentioned it. A lot of what we do is we listen to phone call or calls. We also participate in calls. Uh, we interact with customers. We also look at the competition and we're constantly feeding information back to our product team as they are validating, hey, what do we invest in? What do we put our resources in over the next 12 months, 24 months as we build out the product? Um, so that's a key piece. The other piece is being very good at presentations and being able to go on stage and you know speak whether it's in front of you know 15 people or 3000 people um you've got to go in have an engaging story uh put the product put the you know whatever you're trying to accomplish into a very positive light and um i also think it's also good to have a sense of humor as well because i think that resonates uh, I, i've seen way too much technical marketing that's just dry boring um, would you, so would being, you say the empathetic important. listening skills are important then john 100 yeah. percent. that is that is the key role uh the key uh, talent you must have is is to be empathetic uh because the person that you're working with whether it's a CISO, cio director of infrastructure or even you know, network engineer, security engineer, um, they are living a very challenging life. Uh, the pressures are you know, high from above, they're coming down from below. Um, they're just trying to essentially in a lot of ways survive. <laughs> I've yeah. been there. Um, so you know, trying to help them and making them see the light, helping them to be more successful in their role, that's another piece that you gotta account for. Thanks, John. Jay, anything to add to that? No, well, I think John said it absolutely perfectly. I mean, honesty is is key for for me. I mean, yes, we may work for a vendor, um, but technical people are smart. And and if you are not truthful with them, you will not build those relationships. So you you need to be truthful. Even if you're working for a vendor and the product isn't 100%, be honest, be like, We can do 80% of this very, very well, but we may not be able to do this bit particularly well right now. But I will go off to PM, I'll go off to R&D, and I will come back with a time frame in where we can do it or whether we're not going to do it. And I I suppose this this goes back to John's point about making sure you know your product as well. Yeah. I mean, you you need to also have a breadth of of knowledge. And, And I think because me and John have been around since the Dark Ages doing this, we, we understand the fundamentals particularly well. Um, so therefore, if someone's come to us about, I don't know, an SD-WAN scenario or something, that, or, or it fits into not exactly the product that, that we do, 
we generally would have an idea of, of, of what it is that they require on, on the wider kind of bigger picture. And I don't want to speak, necessarily speak ill of, of, of salespeople, but they don't have... Well, you, you have done so far, so just carry on. Well, they don't necessarily always have the breadth. I mean, I've met some that do, um, but if you've only been selling for, say, 10 years and you've only been selling one product and suddenly you've moved from, say, selling an XDR to, to selling something like SD-WAN, you may not understand exactly the use cases, whereas we've deployed those technologies. We've been there reviewing them, looking at them, creating matrices to see which ones best fit the scenario. We both like to keep up to date with all new tech. So even though things are moving on rapidly in the, in the IT and security arena, we keep up to date and keep doing comparisons. And I think that breadth of kind of knowledge and experience for me is critical. I mean, one of the main reasons I kind of went into this role was because I saw the value as a customer speaking to people like myself before I did this. Yeah. So companies would sell it, send in their trusted advisors who were honest and open with me and, and gave me a good advice still friends with them now and they still mentor me and I, and it was like okay this is a real need out there in the industry for for these type of roles and what about, it, let me just add sorry. in one other thing too uh two things really uh first of all you know jay's and i's experience were we were lucky and fortunate to be at the uh, cusp of, of some serious changes within the network security industry uh jay with zero trust um, being one of the first uh um, IT shops deploying a, a, you know, a, a zero trust uh, product, uh, myself with SD-WAN, SDN. Um, it just allowed for us to be at the forefront and being a pioneer in that space. So we learned a lot. And one of the reasons in when we first had our, our first meeting, conversation, whatever you want to call it, because it was during the COVID period on Zoom, uh, we bonded over that. Uh, it, it's about giving back giving back to the industry, giving back to customers, giving back to people who were previously in our roles uh, that may not have been, you know, have, had come into this technology or were a later adopter. How could we help them uh, make this transition successfully? The second piece I want to add is why is this role important? The way products are sold has changed. In the past, it was very transactional. You showed up, you know, hey, here's my routers, here's my switches, buy them, buy them, buy them. Um, now the sales cycle is much more uh, like a SaaS service. Your, um, your product isn't as sticky. It isn't as, um, it, 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 it could be changed out, you know, over a period of time. Um, and there was a, a great presentation by Martin Crusado in 2016, um, where he was presenting at Interopt and he talked about how the sales cycle would change due to the rise of the developer. So if you have, uh, if you're out on YouTube, go, go, you know, Google, uh, Martin Crusado, 2016 Interopt, an incredible speech where he basically laid it out that, you know, the way transactions were done in the past won't be the way they're done in the future. And what he called out was the need for people like Jay and myself to provide that vision of how do this product uh, can be utilized? Where does it fit within your organization? What are the outcomes uh, that you can expect? Uh, so it's a very different process than your, your old way of doing things. And as well, you know, technology is changing rapidly. So you need people to explain that, to be the evangelist. Uh, and that's why we also love our role at the SEC Forum, where it is vendor neutral. Uh, and our focus is really being on the, you know, the tide that raises all the boats within the SSE, zero trust and sassy space. So, um, yeah, that that's what I was going to say. I think one of the key things to remember is it used to be that things were pretty siloed. As John said, you would go out and buy a switch or a server or a backup device, and they were very much siloed. We're moving now where users and applications and, and data is now everywhere in the cloud, private cloud, public cloud, data centers, everywhere. So the tools that we have, we, they need to do more. We need to be able to sweat those assets, get more out of them. They need secure, to be security focused. So it used to be if you were a switch specialist, you could just live your life just doing switches or networking. Then when VMware came along and other hypervisors, you kind of had to do a bit more. You had to understand networking and storage and server all in one place. 
And now what's happened with kind of SSC and SASE is there's a lot more to it. That it, it covers a lot more layers. You need your IDP team, your infrastructure team, your cloud team. You need all these the security folks. You need everyone to understand. And it's quite unusual to have people that can look across all those areas. It, it, if you Even if you go and recruit in people now, certainly in cyber, you might get a SOC analyst, you might get a pen tester. But if you take one of those people and try and make them do the other role, they'd probably be a little bit lost. But then so, don't, Aren't we seeing, um, because of the need for leadership roles in the industry, there's an awful lot of people who've come from tech backgrounds with quite a narrow focus who've been launched into that position. So I, I would only think that, I suppose, that the demand for what you guys and girls are doing in the field CTO roles are just going to keep increasing and increasing. Do you mind if I drop both your LinkedIn profiles in for QA billings, just in case he wants to pick your brains? Is that all right? Absolutely. And if he can fill out the SSC forum survey, even better. Where, do you want to put the link to that in the private chat and I'll drop it in? I'll get round to it in a second, yeah. All right, okay. So, Alana made a good point. Um, you could switch the word widgets for switches, I suppose. We're not just buying widgets. It's longer-term solutions where understanding the business and the people are key, which I think speaks volumes about. Yeah, me. I mean, I, I think the key thing is, is both John and myself have been through the budget cycles. We've been through them on good years when budget was good. We've been through them through recessions and when things are tough. We've had to lay people off. We've had to then rehire people because things have got busy. So we've not just dealt with necessarily a technology. We've dealt with the, the wider running of large global IT and security teams. And that comes with having to train people, coach, mentor, all, all of the additional stuff and not just going and buying a switch or going and buying a router or going and buying a firewall it comes with a lot more than that so when i sit down and have conversations with people those are the things that could be their pain points they want to do what's right for their team but they also want to and need to do what's right for their business so they're going to be sometimes balancing where do i put the budget i need to secure the environment but to do that maybe i need to lay people off and if we can sit down john and myself and explain Okay, we can help you reduce your cost. Let's look across the board. Let's look at the other things you're doing. That's because you've got that breadth of knowledge that you're able to do that. Yeah. 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 But it's not only that. It's also, um, it could be a question on how do they organize their teams. So uh, moving from a very traditional silo-based organization to uh, more of that cloud-focused team where that you know person that in the past did routers or the person that did... Uh, servers is now more of a um, jack of all trades. Uh, what do they call that person? What does it look like? Or do you divide your teams up and you know become more of that SRE focused, so more cloud forward? How do you do that journey? Uh, what are the elements you need to put into place? What are some of the things as you move to cloud doing this digital transformation you need to be aware of? Uh, Jay and I have both done that. You know, we we we. We transitioned teams from a very siloed, classical, you know, 2000s, 1990s uh, organization to one that has to be more agile, has to be more focused. Um, we've dealt with DevOps. We've dealt with the, the application teams. Uh, and, and if you read our, our uh, articles and things we put out in, you know, the industry, whether it's on a news site or in, you know, LinkedIn, uh, you're, you're not just going to see conversations around SSC and why you need to buy SSC. Uh, you're going to see conversations around team dynamics, breaking down silos, um, how these tools can be used for elsewhere. Infrastructure is code. Uh, it is, you know, it, it is not just focused on what, access sells and one now what hpe will sell or sassy it's like the entire ecosystem around how, it how, it, and how those are a lot in. of yeah. and how it all fits together and why you need to get these things right to be successful as you transition over to you know this new paradigm of, of network and security thanks john i'm um, just bring up a quick comment mike's in the in the audience it seems like he's seen you on a podcast with kev the other day so he's glad to be here but he said early in his career the fact he's been able to budget and propose and demonstrate new softwares to his company is a good stepping stone, some have told me. I Absolutely. Think, uh, yeah, I mean, Jay, have you got any comments on that? The ability to communicate with stakeholders is key in many roles. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's critical. I mean, IT people are not always the best at communication. I mean, we're quite technology-focused people. We sometimes like to keep ourselves to ourselves. Um, but I think as you 
inevitably rise further up the ladder if that's what you wish to do, then you are going to need to take those technical points and explain them to people that fundamentally are not that technical or technical at all. And they, well, and they and they need to understand. I mean, there, there's quite a lot of talk at the moment that you should have more kind of security or technical focus people on the board. But historically, they haven't needed to be. Okay. IT grew out of kind of finance and then it grew and grew and grew. And if you're going to sit down with your CFO or your CEO or your operations director, then they're not necessarily going to understand all the kind of more technical stuff. But you're going to have to translate those things into words and phrases and sentences they understand. And that's the difficult part because we live with the technology every day. And yeah. All the teams I've ever managed have been really, really good technically but there haven't been that many in that team that I would take and, and put in a in a board meeting or a management meeting and say, okay, explain the risks of this ransomware attack, for instance. Now, th those boards never want to know how packets transfer around the world. They just want it to happen. They just want their email to flow. But there are times when you need to explain, certainly at budget meetings, why are you spending X amount of money? You need to talk about the potential consequences yeah. and which means what in their terms. Yeah, and absolutely. being able to do that in business terms. And we talk on the podcast a lot about zero trust. It's a big thing right now. It's not particularly new and it's certainly not a product. But trying to explain that to people in a way that they understand that it's not just a buzzword and explain it from a business point of view is is going to get more and more critical and well, I, i'd just like to say <clears throat> you you managed to achieve that with myself on episode three it took three episodes mind but episode three of the vendor experience where we suddenly saw exactly where what you do would sit into a small business because again you put it in put it in my terms going back to something you mentioned earlier you mentioned that you've got a survey at the moment i'm going to drop the link in the chat for it what is it and why should people do it I'll let John cover that one. Copy. Yeah, so basically we're, 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 we're taking the pulse of um, the industry right now and trying to understand where we are with SASE, where we are with SSE, and what elements are most critical. So uh, it is really, that's what it's about. It's, a, it's, an, SS, it's an SSE, SASE-based uh, survey, and uh, it's got a fun question on the last one. I think it's 25. It's the best one. Yeah, it's the best question. It is the, the best one. See. Yeah. In case and it takes only about six minutes and 20 seconds to do. So and it's, who, it's and not a lot of investment people, of time. What kind of people do you want to do the survey? Is there a particular target demographic? Uh, networking and security folks. So okay. uh, that, that's really that's really what we're after and, and leaders as well. Because there are some, I think there are some questions around budgeting and those sorts of things. Well, I won't, I won't mention who it was. But I will tell you a quick story um, about a CISO that I know. And I won't even mention what country he's in either in case people start to narrow it down. <clears throat> but the the conversation at Christmas time, we were talking about how this person struggles to keep up with all the different trends and focuses and how much he reads. And his statement to me was, now I need to find out what the F in hell sassy is. And I, I can't <laughs> tell you how big the organization is they work for, but it's it's big <laughs> it's a big organization and i think for any leader who's constantly firefighting every day and dealing with different stakeholders and trying to do the day job to keep up to date with that stuff must be extremely difficult as as a leader where would you go other than to people like yourselves to keep up to date on things like that outside of the edge podcast <laughs> Good answer. And do you want to put the link you, for that? That was like, like a softball, actually. man. You just it's, laid that one I know, out. I know, um, I know. Throw it up. <laughs> you got the link uh, for that, John. Yeah, well, you can you can put the link in there. Uh, and the other one I would throw out is, is InfoSec Live. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's hard. It is really hard. I mean, it, there's so much change right now in the industry. Um, the movement to cloud is just accelerated. Uh, this this transformation of technology and you know digital transformation as well. Uh, trying to keep up is is absolutely the mo is is a challenge because in the past what you could do is you could go to a conference. Uh, for me, go, being a networking person, it was Cisco Live. I'd go to Cisco Live, get all the updates. All right, great, new switch, new data center, blah blah blah, new WAN, so on and so forth, and I was good because I had one vendor, and the industry was like, hey, one vendor. 
now everything has changed and um, going to a conference like that really limits your view of, of what the world is really like uh, because there are five or six viable vendors in the networking space. Um, we'll go to RSA next month and we'll find out how many security vendors there are out there and in what verticals do they play in. Um, it is it is in, it impossible to to keep up to date on a lot of things. How I do it, I, honestly, it's, it's a lot of podcasts that I have. I have a regular rotation a podcast that I listen to that kind of keep me up to date and it's, you know, networking, it's cloud, it's um, Deloitte and Deloitte's podcast. It, it could be uh, something along the t- uh, lines of leadership. Um, I do a lot of reading as well. Uh, and then I, there's a few news sites that I go to SDX central is, is a, one of the major sites I go to the register. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is really hard to keep up to date. I, I think for, for, from my point of view, I worked in kind of medium sized companies and I never had a vast team of people. So therefore the way I kept up to date was, and this is before podcasts kind of existed. I listened to them towards the end when they started coming out, I would go to events. That was the only Walkman times. Yeah. Um, and it was other customers or other people in a network. I would do small round table events. I would build up my network and I would ask those people questions because it people refer and and talk best to other it people and i think really that's where the role of the kind of trusted advisor or field cto came from because it's one further step than talking to that network because that network may be good if people are already using that product yeah but if they're not then it, it was because I would see those people in in that network as my trusted advisors. I, I've 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 lived in Japan for a while, and they call it the Seven Samurai. You have seven people around you that you trust, and you go yeah. to them. And I I always had that, and they would be other technology focused people. But sometimes you would go to them and go, "What are you doing about SASE or SSC?" And they would go, "Uh, what do you mean?" So it's nice to have vendors out there with trusted advisors where you can go. And you know they're going to give you the truth and you know they're going to understand the wider picture. So I think that's why I think the complexity in the world we live in today is what is breeding that rise of yeah. CTOs, field CTOs, because I thought, I thought you were softballing me then to say that the best way is laid back networking in a in a relaxed and informal setting. And then I could have started to mention the events that we've got coming up next week. You, you, can, ab- I mean, you can absolutely do that because I mean, that those, like I said, the round table events, obviously I'm in the UK. I've done round tables in, in London and stuff like that. Um, but they're not always conducive to that. Yeah. You, sometimes you yeah. just want a beer and a pizza without pineapple. Um, and a chat or, or a hot dog or something. Do you know what I mean? It just, because depend, I think it depends on the level of people that you are aiming at. Yeah. And some people prefer other events, but I've certainly seen after the pandemic, it's much more the rise of a more relaxed events because I think people are generally not, not going to the big cities, not wearing suits, not wearing ties not doing the stuff that they used to do and people are much more comfortable just to sit on a big table, have a conversation, talk with trusted advisors or customers. I mean, and it's just definitely a more relaxed environment. I think can people I, can are... I jump in and just, just say something quickly. I think you've, yes. um, you've made me think about what I've called my events, <clears throat> my networking events, because they're aimed at leadership to network, knowledge, share, and collaborate, but I've called them the CISO experience. Now, I'm, I'm worried. I mean, we've got a massive turnout for Tampa Bay in Florida, loads and loads of CISOs, but I feel like maybe I'm alienating other leaders in the industry by naming it that. Would you, this is a, a genuine question and not a softball, would you consider renaming it to a leadership series or something similar rather than yeah. the, one, the one role? Yeah, I, I hate the term CXO because it's so broad. Yeah. Um, but that's almost what you're after. You're, you're, you don't want to limit yourself to a CISO. Uh, you, you want to bring in the CIO. You want to bring in, um, you know, the CISO and as well the CTO. 
Uh, but I also think you go well. a, a few levels down. Uh, you, you want you want to talk to the director. You want to talk to the infrastructure manager because at the end of the day, the person making the choice on what product they're going to buy is not the CISO. They're an advocate. They they will they will finally sign off. Uh, but it, it's going to be somebody down lower. Uh, it is going to be, you know, it's going to be a manager of infrastructure, somebody of that sort that actually holds the the purse strings uh, so you can say, yeah, that's the product I recommend. Uh, and, and then leadership just goes, great. You know, Jay's excited about that product. He's he's vetted it. He's signed off on it. His engineering team said thumbs up. It works. Um, and then they take it up to the top. So I, I think it's, I think you're limiting yourself if you just call it the CISO. Yeah. Uh, think, the other thing I want to add. Sorry, John, go on. I was going to add in uh, around Jay's comments. Um, I found it very successful working with people who would have been uh, a field CTO uh, back in my previous role. I reached out, you know, Vijay Sagar is, is somebody that I really know. He was a field CTO for Palo Alto Networks. And he was a guy I went regularly, you know, from 2013 on when we met. Uh, and I would ask him not only about, you know, their, their product line, but people within the industry or what other vendors are doing and, and gaining his insights into how the industry works, um, how, you know, you can leverage the relationship. Uh, another person, Sean O'Dell, who has worked at multiple companies, but primarily at VMware, uh, was another person who I leveraged in the same manner. And I guess what I'm getting at is a lot of companies will look at that relationship between um, a vendor and themselves, the customer, as an ant antagonistic relationship. And I think that's completely wrong. Uh, you need to view it as a partnership, especially the way technologies have developed, how they're deployed, how they're now you know, commingled with what your outcomes are. You really got to view that relationship as a partnership, if not even a marriage, and uh, work to maintain that. So, so do you, yeah. do you think then, John, that there's a lot of negativity, and rightly so in most cases, from CISOs and other leaders with regards to how salespeople approach them? Do you think there needs to be a bit of give and take on both sides when you know the role of a salesperson is to sell something, but equally the role of a leader is to make sure they're abreast and up to date on all the options stuff out there? And I think by just disregarding everyone who comes in your inbox it could be quite a dangerous game to play jay have you got any thoughts on that oh i have to be really careful answering this <laughs> that's why i passed it to you so <laughs> it was very 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 rare that i would ever in, in my previous role in the corporate world i would ever answer the phone to a cold call or ever answer an email to a cold email they just generally went on do not disturb or in the bin. It was only on the very rare occasion that I was sitting there thinking about a particular project that I was doing and an email just might happen to pop in and coincide with exactly my, that. My iPhone does that to me every day about lots of different things. Yeah, it's but it, it, was, it was rare. I mean, I had, if I was, let's say I was working on, I don't know, an SD-WAN deployment, I would do all my research I would talk to my network of the seven samurai. I would go out and I would investigate. I might go to an event. I might go to a network world or something like that. I'd have a conversation with people. And then I might go on their website and request a demo. Um, everybody within Axis knows I'm like a really difficult customer. And I would have been really difficult. I don't mind acknowledging that because I would do as much research as I possibly could before I spoke to anyone. Because, like I said, historically, you didn't want someone pulling the wool over your eyes. If yeah. you're if you're trying to do what's right for your company and you're putting yourself out on a limb to make quite big decisions with someone else's money and things that could potentially put you, your career and your like name at risk, I, I would jump through every single hoop I possibly could to get there. And that's kind of why i became a trusted advisor because i want to make people like my my like me i want to make their lives easier because it was stressful i remember buying um a storage solution from from a startup putting my name out there and saying this is right our, our main data center had failed and we had to replace something and, and we put your head on the block for that as well aren't you yeah i mean because mm -hmm. if that 
if that would have gone wrong, I, I could have potentially cost the company millions of dollars, which meant I could have potentially lost my job, which means it's difficult to get a new one. <laughs> and, and you've got all of that, that kind of stuff. So having people that you know you can get the right information from, and I, I even when I picked a product, I may spend six months doing a design workshop, especially if it was a, a global SD-WAN deployment. I mean, that's not... That's very, very expensive and a long process. It's quite a huge change. It's not like just upgrading your Windows server. It's it's a big deal. You, you really want to make sure you've done your research. So to go back to your question, like cold calling and stuff just didn't work for me. I needed somebody that had, had walked the walk and took the talk. And, and I could I could sit down and have a peer level discussion with. And, and that really didn't exist 15 years ago. No, <clears throat> no, I completely agree. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. We said we do 45, so we've gone over a little bit. But I want to ask you both one last question before we wrap up. Give me an example of what a day in the life of a CTO is actually like. So what was your day to day like, apart from having to come on here and talk to me? It, to uh, be honest, I'll go. You go first, John. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. I was going to say it, it changes every day. So, I mean, obviously that we do SSE forum stuff. So I could be editing a podcast, editing a video, trying to talk to people about maybe being a guest, coming on, talking about topics. We also run a monthly meeting. So it's trying to organize that monthly meeting. It could be writing articles to get published in magazines or to create blogs or to go on LinkedIn and, and do stuff. It could be preparing for presentations that we do. We do webinars, live webinars. We do stuff like this. We also do kind of in-person events. So it's creating the slide decks, getting the marketing team to kind of make them shiny for us. And Camilla, the person we work with internally is, is magic and she kind of ma makes them look very pretty. Um, there could be talking to, customers or prospects um i do the coffee with jay stuff so there could be stuff like that kind of agnostic let's talk about zero trust ztna i go on other people's podcasts so it, it, it literally can be completely different mondays are manic because it's catch-up day um but this week i've got some customer visits i've got some webinars we have to prep for i've got some podcast editing podcast release um I and think, I'm thinking yeah. carefully, thinking carefully before I come to you, John, let me just ask Jay this quick question and think carefully before you answer it. Out of all those different things that you do, what do you enjoy doing the most? I think the conversations with people like yourselves, I, I, the main reason I jump ship and came to do what I do today is because I, I want to help people. And whether that's help people in their day-to-day -day life, m motivate, coach, help them through difficult times, help them select the right product, help them like better themselves and maybe take the step up the ladder a little bit, maybe encourage them to try something else if they're not having a good time. Any of those type conversations. I, I, I like to get to the end of the day every day and think I've helped someone today. That's such a great answer. I mean, those are the facts. I mean, that's, I've always throughout my career wanted the people around me and specifically my team to enjoy what they do. My mum was very clear when I was a young child, do a job that makes you happy because you have to do it a lot. And even this weekend, it was Mother's Day, I spent time with her and she said, you need to do things that make you happy in life because time passes really, really quickly. So I really hope at the end of each day, I've helped someone smile. Well, you, um, helped, you helped me smile yesterday. I had a pretty shitty weekend with my elderly mum. Apart from Mother's Day, it was nice. I took the wife and kids to the beach. And you are a natural. It's, it's clear that you really, really do want to help people. And we've only known each other since December. But you've given me unending moral support and some pretty wishy-washy guidance, but we won't go into that. Um, <laughs> not really. You, you, you have really, really genuinely been there, and it does mean a lot, Jay. So coming to you, John, anything you want to add to what you do every day? Jay, no, I... Jay made up a list of stuff. What's the honest answer? 
Yeah, I mean, he, he's absolutely correct. At the end of the day, it's about helping people. And, you know, that could be a customer who is um, struggling with their network security solution. Uh, it could be someone struggling with how their team dynamics are, are working out. Um, it, at the end of the day, it's about giving advice, being a trusted advisor, um, being a, you know, Jay, both Jay and I were pioneers in, in terms of the technologies we deployed. Uh, so we're helping those people who are coming next. So there's a concept of pioneers, settlers, and town planners. Um, so we were the pioneers and, and next up are the settlers. And then, and then the town planners, they're the um, late majority. So they're, they're the people that are gonna, you know, wait out the technology and, and deploy it later. Uh, but we wanna help those people coming up next and make sure that their journey is successful they're able to achieve their goals uh, and um, trying to help them de-risk uh, the situation. Because again, as a pioneer adopting new technology, well, likely from a startup, when you put your name out there and you, you know, you're, you're talking to your leadership team about bringing in product X and it's a startup, it's a risk, um, yeah. especially, you know, how pervasive is that technology going to be within the organization? If it's, you know, a ZTNA remote access solution or SD-WAN, um, pretty significant because it is, you know, customer facing. It is customers being the employees and, and people within the organization. If it fails or the company fails, runs out of money and you're stuck holding the bag, um, that could be, a, you know, a job changing situation for you and getting that next job could be difficult. On the other hand, if you choose well, and you pick that vendor that is successful, you know, that is acquired or IPOs or does amazing things at a lower price point and you're able to point to that outcome, it certainly helps you in your career. So, um, yeah, to Jay's point, it, it, it's at the end of the day, what, what do I get excited about? It's helping someone. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. Jay, anything you want to add before I wrap things up? Um, no, I mean, uh, what, one thing, a lot of people assume me and John have met before. And actually, I think we've only met officially twice face to face. Yeah. Um, but for me, it highlights that you can be very similar to somebody else. I mean, we we have a great time. We both enjoy what we're doing. There's no ego. There's none of us. We don't try and get one up on each other. And I think that comes across in the things we Absolutely. do. And we we both really are just trying to help people and i think coming from a technology background means that we can help people but in in a technology technological way easy for you to say and i think john tel mm. tolerates you a lot as well am i right yes. john <laughs> <laughs> oh man it was it was funny um so my daughter caught me watching uh one of the the vendor experiences the other day and i think he showed the cup the j cup and she goes oh my god he's famous yeah. How, how is it to work with someone so famous so, <laughs> i hope you've ordered they, they, they no they have the, they have a mug at the house and they love that mug i think they fight over it yeah. I'll, I'll bring you another one when i see you so they can have one each. yeah it's, it's getting it's worn out so it's, it's my favorite actually i've ordered some swag for infosec live this week oh quickly Andrew Bunch was in the audience a little while ago. Andrew is based in Tampa, Florida. He's a member of the InfoSec Live community, and he's also going to come along to our Tampa Bay event on the 30th next week and take some photos for me. So I've got you a lovely, new, shiny InfoSec Live polo shirt, Andrew, and I'll bring that over the pond with me when I come next week. And, and for me, I just want to say a massive thank you to both of you for all the support you've shown me individually and also the support you've shown the show as well. I mean, you've been on a few times now. And as I mentioned before, I think your vendor experiences are soon going to be the most watched episodes on InfoSec Live as well. So you're definitely doing something right, John, and people are definitely tolerating you, Jay. Thanks. I'm glad you said people need a sense of humor because <laughs> it's so it's so important. But uh, <laughs> from my from my point of view, um, thanks, Alana, for tuning in as well. Thank you, Jed. And for anyone who is coming to Tampa Bay next week, be really really looking forward to meeting a few people for the first time for anyone who isn't coming to tampa bay and is in the area we've got a leadership event focusing on the national Cybersecurity strategy document that came out in the us a few weeks back along with the recent sec guidelines we talked to or touched about it earlier about having 
CISOs on the board. Um, we're going to be having a live panel debate hosted by Steve Hindle, who's a prominent local CISO. We've got about five spaces left. So if anyone is interested in coming, it is an invitational event. So please do use the LinkedIn link that I've just dropped in the chat. But Jay and John, thank you so, so much. I really hope I'm going to see you both in San Francisco next month as well. So do I. So I think do we're I. going to be eating some pizza. Excellent. Yeah. Looking forward to it. I'll bring tins of pineapple for Jay as well. Guys, thank you so, fresh, so much. Fresh, fresh, fresh pineapple. Fresh. Is it, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to bring that through customs. I might have to require someone on there. Uh, we, 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 we're kind of close to Hawaii in we, San Francisco. We, we can work on that. But guys, thank you very much. Have an amazing rest of the day and I'll catch you all soon. See and you yeah. later. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.